All right. Well, hello there. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of the EV Revolution Show, episode 100. I'm so excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. My fake audience here at Greece is very happy with episode 100. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. As you can see, I'm doing things a little bit differently today because I have some guests with me, and I thought I'd liven the show up uh, by having a UK invasion here. I've got a couple of great fo folks and friends and EV uh, enthusiasts and experts. They know much more than I do, so I think you'll get uh, more of a benefit on this show. But again, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to tune in as I uh, hear to educate minds one tailpipe at a time. So let me introduce my guests that I have here. First guest is a Dr. Ewan McTurk. He's an electrochemist and electric vehicle battery engineer. See, I only get very smart people for you guys, folks, who has been driving EVs for over a decade. Um, he's, uh, he's got a PhD, only a PhD, you know, what does he know, right? In, in material science uh, from the uh, University of Oxford. Uh, Ewan is also the creator of Plug Life Television, which is a great YouTube channel. I looked at that as well. Talks about EVs, battery tech, all that kind of stuff. He busts myths, which is great. Welcome, Ewan. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, great to be on. Thank you for having us, Ken. Oh, it's great. Boy, I'm out of breath on that intro now. The second, <laughs> <Yeah>. second burst. <laughs> um, I've got James Coates. So he's an EV powertrain build engineer for an automotive manufacturer and has been driving EVs since 2012. So pretty well pioneer days when it comes to EVs almost. You've got 25 years of experience. I don't know how, because you're so young looking, James, working in the motor trade in various roles. James and his wife, Kate, who you probably know, James and Kate are also the creators of that YouTube channel, which is fantastic. Uh, I watch it all the time and I encourage everybody to watch it. Welcome, James. Thank you very much for having me, Ken. It's great to be here. It's fantastic to have you guys on the show. I much, much appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. So now that my audience knows that I've got, you know, smarter people than me on the show to talk about things, they're probably going to pay attention. Um, so what I thought I'd do is keep it fun. Uh, I've got some topics that we'll talk about, and then um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some conversations, uh, especially about battery stuff, because I know, James, you and I, We've had this conversation about before about what some of the other non-Tesla people, there are other EVs besides Teslas out there, even though you're sitting in one, James. Thank you for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, that actually do pretty good on the battery circuit, right? Do, do not bad. So we're going to get into that. But let me start with um, uh, Nissan. And I, I'm going to roll some some footage here. And I wanted to get your guys' opinions. So, you know, I think this is great for Nissan to step it up. They've been a little behind the eight ball with their electrification. I mean, it is time for them to kind of catch up with what's going on. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts about this? Uh, Ewan, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I was initially skeptical about the, the ARIA. Um, in fact, uh, one of the, the first uh, publicity videos they did of it um, when they were showing you it being tested out in the snow. I remember I, I tweeted, um, I'm assuming that the snow that's being kicked up against the underside of the car is the closest that that EV is going to get to an active thermal management system. Um, thankfully, I was proven wrong only a few days later because it turns out that unlike the LEAF, Mm -hmm. But what the Aria has is a liquid-cooled battery pack. So that is a, a huge difference. The, the ability of a, a liquid thermal management system to remove heat from the battery system is well known to be highly effective. It's what the typical leading um, EVs tend to use, not least Teslas. So it's really good to see that they've not only uh, you know, done something about active thermal management, but they're right up there at the, the top end of what we're seeing in commercial vehicles. The cells that they're using, they're using CATL prismatic mm -hmm. cells. So uh, I'm not too sure if that's um, NMC 622 or 811. These numbers and letters, for anyone who doesn't know, NMC means, uh, so you've got a lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide mm -hmm. cathode. The, uh, the you know the positive electrode in a lithium ion battery. The numbers in the case of NMC six two two means it's six parts nickel for two parts manganese for two parts cobalt, and then eight one ones eight parts nickel one part manganese one part. Throw cobalt. a little rum into that, and you've got yourself a cocktail. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's going to be reasonably low cobalt what they're using anyway in yeah. in the grand scheme of things. When we move towards high nickel, low cobalt 
uh, cathodes, we tend to find that the cells themselves are less heat tolerant. So they're prone to more degradation at higher temperatures or during rapid charging. And uh, that's where the liquid thermal management system is mm -hmm. pivotal because that will ensure that that battery is kept in really good condition for hundreds of thousands of miles. You know, you, you've answered all the questions as far as why it's important, that whole Goldilocks, right? Keep them at an optimum temperature uh, throughout cold, warm uh, climates. Uh, James, now we're seeing some running footage and a little bit of audio that came through on this uh, from what they sent me. What's your opinion? What do you want to add to all that? So in terms of the way it looks, because that's the first thing that appeals to me, is, and it, it's an SUV, it's the biggest growing market, so it, it makes sense that that's where Nissan would, would uh, head with the next vehicle. Yeah. More margin, um, right? More popularity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Like Ewan said, thermal management, it's key. You, you you can't be bringing vehicles to market now without some kind of thermal management. It's just, it makes no sense. And yep. Nissan, of all people, have learned through the various phases that, uh, it, that it, it's a necessity, um, simply because they've seen the, the degradation that each pack has, has suffered and, and the, the charging restrictions, as Ewan mentioned. The, the, the looks as a whole... I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of okay with it. I can see where they've gone for the aerodynamic low drag coefficient front end. It's all smoothed over, so I, th I think that'll be a, that'll work well and maybe get the um, the range to a, a decent standard. Yep. Yeah, I think I think they're doing they're doing a good job. They've gone for the right sector, and it's good to see them back in the game because ultimately they were one of the forerunners. You know, it was Tesla, Nissan, Renault, and there wasn't really much else on the market at one point. The Leaf, the Leaf as we know it, is essentially the same car in in the body so it's got a bigger pack but actually it's it's had a front and a rear lift and in its, its yeah. very latest um re, uh, revision it's it's practically the same car still there's still original parts from the original leaf yeah. in there which which i think they need to move away from now and, and give us something new spoken like a true engineer <laughs> Well, <laughs> we don't, exactly. The, the thing you is, the thing and is those, right? <laughs> the thing is with engineering, though, Ken, is that actually, if the part works, you know, you you've got to think, well, why change yeah. it? You know, exactly. it's, it's it's hard it's hard to move away from something that works so well, and 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 if it does, people want to keep it. So. For sure, and your whole you know cost of uh, economies of scale and all that kind of stuff, right? Definitely, so, definitely. definitely. Yeah, as I said on my show, I'm really happy to see. Nissan kick it up and, and to get in with this vehicle. Uh, estimates for deliveries are going to be mid, mid part of next year uh, for some parts and then into North America, the latter part. Uh, but again, with COVID and everything going on, I tell people, mm -hmm. you know, dates are, dates are subject to be slipping. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's good to see them. My only concern about the, the Aria, um, I mean, it seems to be well engineered, but it's actually, it looks at the moment as if it's going to result in a significant increase in the embodied carbon of Nissan's EVs uh -huh. because they've announced that they're going to be making the Aria uh, in Japan and then shipping it worldwide. And I don't yeah. mean this from some sort of self-interested, we should be buying British sort of thing. I mean this from the fact that Nissan Sunderland in the northeast of England is on one of the cleanest parts of the UK's national grid. Um, it's typically about 55 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and that makes the Nissan Leaf, which is made in Sunderland, one of the cleanest electric cars in the world. In fact, the latest episode of Plug Life Television uh, covers this, the, the embodied carbon of, of EVs versus ICs. Yep. Yeah. So what we have is the Japanese grid, uh, obviously a lot of nuclear was wiped out after Fukushima, quite understandably. Uh -huh. Progress is being made with renewables, but uh, particularly with floating solar farms, which are really interesting because the water helps to keep them cool, which maximizes their efficiency. But uh -huh. it's not happening quick enough. It's still quite a carbon intensive grid. The embodied energy is going to translate into quite a high embodied carbon when they're making that chassis and then CATL batteries manufactured in China where there's quite yeah. a lot of fossil fuels on the grid. That yeah. said, they could offset that by carpeting the roofs of these factories with solar panels, ideally sticking some wind turbines nearby. They could have an mm -hmm. island of low carbon renewable energy in a sea of dirty fossil fuels. You can do that anywhere in the world. And I strongly encourage both Nissan and CATL to do that or to utilize yeah. their factories that already have access to that low carbon. I think that might be something that we start to see 
being implemented in years to come is when we go and look at a fossil fuel car and it says 45 miles to the gallon or this, we'll be looking at an electric car and it'll be saying embodied energy, this, yeah. this is where it's made. And, and people yeah. will want to know. People do want to know. That's a really interesting point that you have brought up there and, and yeah. it's, it's important. And maybe something that I look at a car and think, no, I'll take that one. It's cleaner. Mm -hmm. Well, great discussion on that. Let's shift gears to Tesla because everybody loves me to talk about Tesla and love all of us to hear more about what those guys are doing. Um, you know, they, they just came out with their uh, Q2 uh, first half of the year uh, earnings, which was higher than, than what they called, what analysts expected, which is all good. Um, I won't get into the numbers per se because they did quite well, but certainly um, for the first quarter, they sold just over, uh, just under 91,000 units and that's total product line. So that's the three, that's the X, that's the Y, that's, uh, uh, uh everything. Then the S, sorry, uh, Q2 and the Y came out, um, uh, added 88,496. So for a total of just uh, almost 180,000 for the first half of this year, um, the second quarter, they are actually down 5%. Um, so it's a good story. I just, again, I've been trying to track these global numbers, as you guys know, uh, and my, my followers know, just with my predictions on the year. And it's still, you know, it's still a little bit of controversy because I'm, I'm saying it's a bit more reserved uh, just because of the reality of the situation. But then some analysts and people are talking that we, we are going to overachieve what we did last year from a plug-in sales. Now Tesla's predicting that they still want to do 500,000 units, which means they need to do, you know, a 300 and some odd thousand units in the next six months. Now I know that, you know, China's Shanghai is up and running. Um, you know, they're kicking off a second tent or whatever. I, I lose track of what they're doing in Fremont. Um, you know, the, the, they're still, you know, uh, a ways away from doing anything in Berlin. And uh, they've only announced uh, the Texas uh, plant, so that's not that's not going to have any impact this year. Um, what do you guys think? Are you going to be able? Are they going to be able to spool up their manufacturing to reach these kind of numbers? Well, they've done it before, haven't they? And Elon's quite good at sticking a tent up in a car park and building cars. So I think if anybody's going to do it, it probably is going to be Tesla and Elon. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he, he cracks the whip and and he gets the results. So I, I wouldn't put it past him. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. A key element, I think, in that is the supply chain and, and with their mantra of controlling as much of that as possible so that they can be more accurate in their predictions or they can at least be, uh, uh, you know, have more reins on what happens in their whole supply chain as they go to manufacture, as they build. So I think that's important because we know, you know, when we talked about, we mentioned the Koreans earlier, and we'll get into those later on the show that we know that there are, there are supply chain issues with batteries, with cells, right, from different manufacturers globally. Tesla doesn't seem to be suffering from that because, you know, of, of what they do on the supply chain, their partnership with Panasonic and others now and, and gobbling companies. Um, so, Ewan, is that, is, is that something then that, we, that Tesla shouldn't worry about, that that probably won't impact their, their balance of your production because of that approach? Um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to like their, their kind of in-house battery supply. Obviously, you know, they've had a bit of a relationship with Panasonic, but it does seem to be healing. Um, that said, I've been quite impressed at what they've been doing with uh, their, their Chinese gigafactory and the supply deals that they've been inking there. So, um, yeah, CATL, again, features, um, particularly interestingly, using lithium iron phosphate chemistry, which does not contain cobalt, um, and is is actually quite an ethical chemistry to make. It's, it's mm -hmm. pretty sustainable materials that are in there. Generally not used in passenger cars because um, it's, it's quite a low energy density, but they've managed to engineer it in such a way that it's got sufficient range for a standard range Model 3. So they've actually got a very ethical um, entry-level offering for the, the, the Model 3 in China. LG Chem are providing the cells for the, uh, for the longer range vehicles using cobalt-containing cathodes, but that's to be expected. Um, so the fact that they are starting to branch out and looking at you know, different regional suppliers for, you know, for um, basically keeping up with the number, with the volume of chassis that they're making, um, it looks as if they've managed to get it under control. Um, and certainly I've, I've seen sufficient 
progress from from what I've heard of anyway um, at the Nevada Gigafactory with the battery supply there. So that should be okay. Yeah. And of course, yes, with the acquisition of the likes of Maxwell and the, the in-house development of, of uh, Cell Tech, it could well be that they ultimately do move their battery production in-house. Yes, Panasonic currently do it in-house, but I mean Tesla themselves do it rather than having a third party on their premises doing it. Um, Battery Day, I think, is scheduled for the middle of September. September, There's going to be some interesting developments there. Even if it's just a a subtle improvement in conventional lithium-ion chemistry, it'll be interesting to see what they plan, particularly if they make those first steps towards... um, cutting ties with established battery manufacturers and doing it themselves, actually, you know, Tesla branded cells. Yeah, absolutely. No good points. I mean, financially looking at their, their financial statements, um, the summary that came out, I mean, there's certainly where they're in the four consecutive quarters of profit, which is something they, they've never done. So that's good to see they're on that role. And, you know, as far as cash on hand, when you peel off some of those layers, um, they're in very positive shape as far as that goes, even with their, their continued R and D and expenditures that they're moving forward with in the additional plants and and, and you know land grabs and all this kind of stuff to to get that going, uh, so they're in a very positive situation. Not surprising that their their um, you know their capital value is you know from a market per perspective is what it is. I think it's a little high, but uh, you know who am I? I'm not a market analyst that deep. So uh, I guess financially they've got the money to do it. They've they know the systems, as you said, James, they've, you know, they've done this before. Elon, you know, he can be a bit of a loose cannon, but you know, he's a smart guy, uh, knows his stuff. And if he thinks they can pull off 500,000 units this year, then I, you know, I certainly would probably, if I bet against them, it wouldn't be a lot of money. No, Tesla time as well. I always, always factor that in. But people seem to let it go, don't they? That Well, he nearly made it. It was close enough. Not quite. I remember um, back in the, day of the model x they got caught short out with some supply chain uh, supply chain issues and i think that was a learning curve for tesla and i think that's why they've applied to self in the way they have with uh, what you were saying about the acquisition of different companies bringing everything in-house and it's it's the smart money is on that you could just, if you if you're looking after everything from start to finish you know you, you really are in control so. absolutely correct um i think they're hitting the, the boxes as this analyst says because they are still cranking out the quantities and that's one thing that we're not seeing from the other OEMs. Um, is that, in your guys' opinions, is that be, if we take away the supply chain for a sec, is that just because they're not, they're still not motivated? My opinion is they're not because they're not profitable. It's expensive. They're they're shirking it as much as possible. Uh, what do you guys think? Well, yeah, other OEMs, the legacy OEMs still have internal combustion engine vehicles to sell. Um, even if they stopped making them today and switched their entire production lines to EVs, so they would have goodness knows how many in their inventory across dealer forecourts um, mm-hmm. across many, many countries. So, yeah, it would be a hard sell to try and say, you know, do you want this V8 diesel or whatever in comparison to an electric car, which even if they initially marked it as being more expensive to buy um, purely to try and, you know, give the ICE stuff a, a, a lead in terms of a price point, even if the EVs are actually not really that much more expensive to produce these days, you know, people are still going to go, well, the EV is going to be more reliable and the running costs are going to be cheaper. So I'm going to go for that. And then the ICEs become stranded assets. Really, there needs to be, some change of, of legislation that will allow uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, brand new ones that these OEMs have, to be recalled, uh, refitted with an electric drivetrain and then sold as brand new EVs. Because I, be- I believe at the moment there is government legislation in some, if not all, markets that would say mm-hmm. you could not then call that EV new. Uh, or that car a, a new car because it's already been registered yeah. Um and it's been I've, you're taken back in order. That's a that's a good point. I, but I, I've you know I've heard that argument for a lot of people that the governments really need to step it up and push it. But you know, I kind of flip that back to saying, but really, I mean, it's the consumer that buys. Um, and you know what we do on our shows and 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 talks and and where we go and do our things, it's all about education, right? Ed- educating consumers into the benefits of what what they may not know about. Um, but it goes beyond that. I mean, we need cost parity. We really need, I think, 
the consumers to step it up, to, to want, because that's what I hear from OEMs when I talk to them, is that, well, we go where there's demand. And if there's demand in SUVs and pickup trucks, then that's where we're going to focus our time and attention. Uh, you know, James, uh, you're heavily in, invested in, in the auto industry for what you do. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's it's a really, it's a kind of a, a bit of a catch-22. What you were saying is right. We've got a lot of uh, vehicles that are in inventory, especially now, mm -hmm. because we've yeah. had months of not selling vehicles. Some companies out there, we're talking numbers, sub-hundreds, that have been sold so really low numbers um so a massive backlog of vehicles they need to move those the the bread and butter is still ice vehicles so they they want to get them moving the other problem you've got is a lot of legacy builders were quite slow off the mark uh, people discounted tesla probably up until the point where they were over 10 years old and they still thought that what tesla were doing was never going to take off um and they were wrong and now they're playing catch up. So you've got companies who are trying to bring an electric vehicle to market and that takes years, five, six years to, to build a, a full EV from the ground up. To, that, by to, the way, that's a typical cycle for any model, right? New model from an OEM. Yeah, it's yeah. a five to seven yeah. year cycle, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So when you look at something like, uh, I'd say the, um, the new Nissan, for example, yep. that would have been years in the making. So when we were saying Nissan aren't doing anything, they absolutely were, but we only see it now and we, we don't understand, we don't understand the, 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 the making of it. It's, it's a very, very expensive and long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's difficult for OEMs to get there, but then there is that point of, well, if we can't buy it, then we're not going to make it. And, you look at people like Kia and they restricted the, the sales of vehicles in certain continents yes. um, due to battery shortages, which is interesting because some of the batteries they use are the same batteries that we use and we've got no issues with supply yeah. issues of, of batteries exactly themselves. What I, yeah. yeah. I thought yeah, that but, too. I called them out. I said, I think they're, yeah. they're actually deliberately constraining it at themselves. Well, there's normally between three and four million individual cells at, mm -hmm. the, at the place where I work. So mm -hmm. there's, and they're readily coming in pallets and pallets and pallets of them. And to put that into perspective, that's purely for prototype. Mm -hmm. So that's wow. not for production. So wow. it's only for prototype. Um, but uh, this, the going forward, the, it's manufacturers need to work harder. A lot of the legacy manufacturers do. Governments need to do something. They do because there's people out there saying, well, look, I can, I can drive a diesel. Nobody's going to stop me from buying it. It's 10 grand cheaper than an electric car. Why should I change? Why should I go and buy an electric car, which is, let's be honest, less convenient. Filling up with diesel is more convenient. It does go further, but it does cost more. Mm -hmm. But So th there's that as well. You've got to incentivize people to go and do that. Yep. So we, we, we need to be working together to help each other. It's, it's an expensive game. It is an expensive game, but it's got to happen and hopefully it will. But well, I don't know who moves first. It's a yeah. bit of a chicken well, and think, egg, isn't it? I, mean, I think they all need to move, right? You and you were yeah. kind of alluding to that fact that all these mm. chess pieces, if you want to use that analogy, need to be moving in, in, in a, you know, at the same time to get this going. So we'll, uh, We'll wait and see, but it's a good it's a good analysis, and I and I'm glad that you guys brought some additional clarity onto what's kind of going on. Uh, last bit of news before we jump over to the Koreans, which will be our last part, is um, BMW has announced that they've uh, they're putting a summer hiatus on their Munich plant because they're going to retool so that they can start pumping out the pure electric i4. Uh, I'm kind of excited about that vehicle because again, it's going after the Model Three ish marketplace, yeah. right? That luxury sedan. <laughs> All electric. Uh, so by uh, by mid September, they're going to start kicking these things out. From what I read in the article, um, are you guys seeing any any groundswell from BMW out in your neck of the woods? Um, you know, this is uh, these are going to have CATL batteries. Uh, I mean, it looks like they've got everything, all the right steps in place. What do you think? Uh, I'll start with you, Ewan. Yeah, I mean, BMW have generally been pretty decent with their battery design. They've gone down the prismatic route from day one, um, and I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly aware of what the battery packs look like when they're dissected. Um, the format of battery they use, it was very to upgrade the battery pack in the i3. And we actually have the, the new i3 today has 
double the capacity of the original I3 that only took six years to, to reach that extent. I would imagine such as the format that they're going to be using for the I4, if they're, if they're continuing with Prismatic, we should see a similarly easy way to, to upgrade those, those packs, um, potentially even retrofitting them as time goes by with newer, better chemistry. Um, so BMW have generally been pretty good with their EVs, but the, the downside has been that the heart has not been there with their CEOs who have continuously downplayed their EV market. They've continuously said, oh, we're going to continue to invest in diesel. Um, EVs are very much going to be niche for the foreseeable future. I can't remember the name of the CEO who said that and promptly no. got the boot. Yeah, I forgot. But yeah, um, right. yeah they're, they're playing catch up now. I do like the Leipzig factory because it's re- powered by renewables. That's where the I3 is made. Um, you know, they've, they've been quite ethical in that sense. The I3 was very well designed because of its recycled and recyclable materials. But um, yeah, they've, they've still got more work to do to convince me that they're, they're fully behind this. But it does look as if they're finally um, making uh, you know, some, some positive moves. Uh, you're right. They need to get a bit more sincere. But, you know, James, are you kind of seeing that? You're, you're plugged into that marketplace as well. Yeah, so actually BMW do cross ties a lot with manufacturers in the UK. Uh, so we we get to see, similar to you, and we get to see what their powertrains look like. And, and yeah, they're great. They're, 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 they're so well engineered. Probably only second to Tesla in the way they're, they're put together. Um, the the problem that I've got with BMW, apart from the front grille on that that i4 it is just horrific who let that who passed that through finance i mean it's just awful but bmw do love uh, they do love a front grill don't they but the the issue i've got is that i don't think manufacturers have really tuned in to quite how the market's evolving and the way that so tesla are currently doing this in sales everywhere you look the sales are going up and up and up and I think they are missing the point to a degree about what they're trying to sell to the consumer. So consumers now, so we're all getting older and we've got this new generation coming in and we, we forget this. There are a younger generation and younger generations are gamers, they're techie, you know, they don't listen to Walkmans, you know, they listen to iPods, iPhones and everything like that. They want to get in the car, they want to connect it to the car, they want something that evolves with them. And that's what Tesla do. And I think manufacturers need to tune into it because they're still selling cars of old just with an electric powertrain in them. And I don't think that is enough. It's enough for some people, but it's not enough for the new generation. The new generation is only getting bigger and we're getting smaller. So I think they need to concentrate on that and, and see what's happening as they, well, I think we'll end up with manufacturers, you know, falling by the wayside, which we don't want. It, it is it is a, a paradigm that is shifting. You're absolutely right. Mm. You know, it's a different buyer than it was 20, 30 years ago, for, especially is. from the automotive landscape. You know, mm. you're absolutely right. You've got to hit those buttons. Polestar might be one of the closest that's doing that now. And, you know, just by what I see, you know, they're taking mm. that similar approach, right? They're going yeah. after that kind of market, you know, the swipe market, you know, yeah. keyboards. What's a keyboard? You know, <laughs> like all this Completely. kind of stuff. I've seen a few reviews of the Polestar recently, some very, very good ones. And, yeah. and actually to look at, I thought that's, that's a, good, a good competitor to Tesla. And it's, that's only what Elon ever wanted was a competitor to Tesla. So yeah. he's, he's done what he wanted. Yeah, absolutely. And um, actually following on from uh, James's really good point about the, the move towards um, pretty much being a computer on wheels, which, which Tesla has, has done. They, they designed the computer first, basically, and kind of, you know, the car around it. Um, it's, it's not necessarily as expensive as people might think it is and other OEMs might think it is. Allegedly, the Tesla Model 3 slash Model S center console being a giant touchscreen is cheaper to engineer than custom designed, you know, actual physical buttons. Um, I don't know if that's actually true, but that's what I've heard anyway. Um, and also, you know, presumably it's easier to kind of swap that, in yeah. and out. Mm-hmm. It's a standard component that can be reoriented for other vehicles. What I really like is what BM, not BMW, sorry, what Volkswagen and by extension Seat and Skoda mm-hmm. have done with the uh, with the e up the, the city go e or the seat me platform mm-hmm. which uh, instead of going right we need to put a, a computer in this they've gone yeah. you're a millennial you've got a phone you put it on the dashboard we'll give you an app you just 
put it on your dashboard and then that becomes the control yeah. for the car and it becomes the sat nav so they've basically gone you do it and in the process of doing that that saved a ton of money and it's made the car even more affordable but it could still drive without it um so yeah that, that's a really shrewd move that helps to bring costs down even further yeah really really good point there you're in a really good car incidentally we have a review of that car out tonight and that point there about the phone was was brilliant they it used to be a garmin removable sat nav uh unit and they've just costed it out and and you get your mobile phone you you dock it in and that's it you've got everything there and not only the EOP and the say at me and the Skoda Citigo now is only available as an EV. There's no petrol or uh, internal combustion variant of that. And it is cheap. You can have that. I think it was 17,000 pounds that I've seen them going for. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, the, it's got a 30, 36.8 kilowatt hour battery in there. And it's such a good car. Really is a good car. I hope you know, it sells really well. Yeah. And that's yeah, a great yeah. price point. I mean, that's where we need for mass market adoption. Um, I want to cover one last story for time here on the Koreans. Now we talked, James, again, you did a review on the, the Seoul. You've experienced the e-Nero or the, uh, here, the Nero EV. Um, I've experienced and, and the uh, Hyundai Ioniq as well. And the Kona, we've all kind of know about those vehicles. The biggest surprise and the takeaway, the, and again, these aren't ground up designed vehicles for battery only. These are internal combustion vehicles that are electrified um, on, you know, similar, on the same lines pretty well as uh, their, their uh, ice cousins are being built on. Yet, when you get in there and you, you're driving this box on wheels like the Soul is, and I love the new Soul mm-hmm. design, um, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm getting 500 kilometers, 300 miles on this thing. And it's like, whoa, where's this coming from? What are they doing? What's their secret sauce? And, and you and let me start with you because you're, you're the chemistry expert guy, the battery guy. Why are they so successful in being efficient and, and their range is just kicking butt? Well, I think to be honest, the, the, the range comes more from the motor design than the battery design, but the battery design that uh, Hyundai and Kia are coming up with is is quite interesting particularly the mark one hyundai ionic which is renowned for its super quick rapid charging ability it was one of the first non-teslas to go above 50 kilowatts um, oh, really? okay. when when capable mm-hmm. a 28 kilowatt hour battery pack yet as james knows well in that video of him jonathan portfield and your man in the ionic so there was a race cross-country race from yeah, leicester right. to to aberdeen docks and uh, it was between a 30 kilowatt hour leaf a 40 kilowatt hour leaf and a 28 kilowatt hour hyundai ionic yeah. the ionic won it comfortably it should have won it by 40 minutes but it was actually a photo finish with the 30 kilowatt hour nissan leaf reason being the ionic alone had to take a detour but because yeah. it can rapid charge so quickly it was back yeah. on the road in no time and because it can right. easily do five miles per kilowatt hour of electricity mm. even at motorway speeds it's, it's just mm. insane Two yeah. really Those interesting things about the Ionic that also to some extent apply to other uh, South Korean EVs. One, the Ionic's cooling system is actually scavenged air from the cabin. The thinking being that uh, in summertime it's going to be hot, so you'll have the air conditioning on. So it takes cool air from the cabin, blasts it through the battery. With um, winter time, obviously the thinking is it'll be really cold, so you'll have a heating on and it puts the warm air from the cabin uh, through the battery and it genuinely does manage to regulate the battery temperature really well james any other tricks that they might have up their sleeves to to add to well, efficiencies well it's a difficult one because of the soul which incidentally i loved a fantastic car and actually the looks are really warm too by by the week at the end of the week Ooh. i thought you know what yeah. I, I really like it at, but at first glance I, was like, mm, I wasn't so sure but it is essentially a shoebox on wheels and to look at that, the coefficient of drag must be, I don't know, horrific. It must be bad. So like Ewan said, it must be in the motors, uh, the, the efficiency that they're getting from the motors because everything goes against it. It's, it's the wrong shape. If you look at a Nissan Leaf, which is a little bit more glided down at the front, a Tesla Model S, they've gone for that sleek design. Um, the Model 3 as well, it, it's sleek, it's low. That's just up in the air like this it's it's just heading to the wind so for me 
I don't know what they're doing apart from smoothing the front off, removing the grill, but just an awesome car. Awesome car. So, Absolutely. so impressive. But I, I know that for the company I work for, we're not designing EVs that are that shape. <laughs> no, I know. Of course you're not, because they're not sexy enough. <laughs> no, but the, well, you know, they wouldn't go far wouldn't, enough either. <laughs> wouldn't go far enough. <laughs> no. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's, that's some great insight. And, and what I want to do on closing the show is just get your, your, your couple of minutes each thoughts on how you see the second half of this year playing out. How, how do you guys think that that's going to impact uh, the EV market is specifically in your areas or, or for what you know in your knowledge. And let's start uh, you into, for you to close that off. Yeah, so certainly within the, the UK market, um, arguably the, the biggest um, impact is not going to be uh, the revival of the ability to drive internal combustion engine vehicles with the lifting of lockdown. The biggest impact is going to be um, the fact that everyone has started using teleconferencing. So there's going to be considerably less travel. That said, I've already seen a considerable number of people saying because of coronavirus, because of lockdown, because of the, you know, the sort of mandated local walks, um, you know, th through really clean streets with really fresh air, which they couldn't, you know, they, they noticed the difference because there's not any traffic fumes anymore. People are genuinely looking into EVs now. That is combined with the 0% benefit in kind for company cars. Some people still, you know, do still need to drive everywhere. Um, there's a number of electric vans coming onto the market, which are better priced and quite well sized. At last, the ENV 200 from Nissan has credible competition. Um, I think we are going to see uh, an astronomical uptake in electric vehicles for the second half of this year. That has been led by the Tesla Model 3, which was the best-selling car in April, closely followed by the Jaguar I-Pace, actually. But with Nissan Leaf also in the top 10, you know, the, the, those figures are there. And that's despite you know the restrictions on being able to buy cars. People were still buying EVs. They really wanted EVs. And with the increase from company cars, you know, we're, we're going to see um, a significant uptick. The one thing that really impacts EV sales, other than physically getting the numbers to satisfy demand. So for example, the Skoda Citigo E that we mentioned earlier, um, Skoda only allocated 300 of them to the UK. They've sold out like that. They need to bring in more. The demand is massive. If, if we had as many EVs as we could get our hands on, I can guarantee you, like, you know, they'd be selling double, triple the number that they will do by the end of the year. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm right with you in there. The, I think the impact of coronavirus has been, you know, it's been bad worldwide, but it's also had a good effect and people have, have seen actually what the downturn has done. We've had clean air, we've had clean water. So people have seen that. So I think a lot of people have woken up to the impact. The, the other thing is that people are going to start working from home now, as you mentioned. And so people aren't going to need to travel as much. So that, demand for people needing to have that internal combustion car to do three, 400 miles a day probably isn't going to be there, but definitely it's going to have a good effect on electric vehicles. As we've seen, sales have been going up and like you said, it's going to be Tesla at the front. And I think it will be for many, many, many years to come and everybody else will be trying to catch them up. And I think as Tesla has done, it's dragged everybody out of nothingness and, and ice vehicles and it's dragged them into the world of EVs and the, the it's sort of like Tesla is shooting up like that and everybody else is trying to catch up behind them and that's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger till eventually it's a big square full of EVs that's the way I foresee it I know you go with the hockey sticker uh, approach Ken I hear you mention that quite often yeah uh, just it's, the way the graphs look yep yeah, it's, it's, it's getting nearer. More people are waking up to it and they, they make sense. They're, they're just so cheap to run. Exactly. The economic, as you guys talk about in the health benefits, I think are key drivers. You know, mm. um, uh, as I said, just the reason I'm a little down on the overall expectation is just mainly more so the economic uncertainty. So people's willingness that they want to go and buy an EV or do something from a health benefit, I think is there. It's, do they want to take the risk and make it that kind of big purchase? We'll have to wait and see. I mean, there's no, there's no lack of housing market. I can tell, I'm not sure about where you guys are, but you know, there's uh, housing market in North America, at least in Canada is going crazy. So, so, and that's a yeah. huge ticket item. Like cars kind of come next. So that was my only reservation on where the numbers could go. But I certainly agree that 
what's happening now is an awareness and people are now, we can go and talk about the health benefit angle, which maybe we couldn't have a couple of years ago. It hasn't changed. It's always been there, but now people yeah. will be more receptive and, you know, more of the economic value, even though we don't have cost parity yet. I think when we get cost parity, then it's a no brainer, right? It's like, why wouldn't you? from that perspective, if you're going to buy, you know, a Honda Civic, yeah. why wouldn't you look at a Leaf or something, you know, whatever comparable to that Ionic. And um, uh, so, so I think that's really where it's going to drive the market. I do wonder if that means that we're going to see the kind of early uh, or earlier um, sort of increase in pace of mobility as a service. Then um, if you have your kind of Uber style thing, but if that's autonomous or if it's, um, you know, you, yeah, basically electric vehicles again kind of tie in with mobility as a service. And if people are reluctant to share some form of public transport with uh, with others, if they want to try and minimise that contact, and if it's not quite e-bikeable, then we may see an increasing demand for uh, electric Ubers or, or electric some other variant of mobility as a service. Well, I'm definitely going to have to have you guys back to do another show to talk about that because that's another hour that we can go down that uh, that uh, topic of uh, mobility and autonomy. Uh, you know, I have my opinions on that. I think it's all good, but you know, we got a long way to go yet. But we we should probably cycle back on that. That's great. Um, you know, I want to thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules to sit with me for an hour or so and have a really great discussion about the marketplace and some of those top stories. I'll give you guys a minute to plug yourselves. Ewan, um, I talked about your show, but how can folks find you and uh, what can they do to subscribe? Yeah, thank you. So I have my own website now, uh, www.pluglifetelevision.co.uk. You'll also find us on YouTube. Uh, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash plug life television or just google plug life television and uh, you'll also find me on twitter as well at 106 ewan excellent excellent and james uh working out of your mobile office there i love it uh what are, what are the stats on you how can people find you so very much like Ewan, we are on Twitter. Uh, if you either just search James, Kate and Florence or at Kate Phantom, you'll find us. Also on YouTube, um, you'll find basically uh, we're there to educate people about EVs and, and we do road trips and uh, just reviews of EVs. So um, you can find us there as well. Just search James and Kate and uh, we'll, we'll come up if you do that in a Google search. Also, if you search for us, you probably will find Ewan. And probably if you find you in, you will probably find us. And like EV Rev Show, we're all sort of connected in the same way. So uh, I tend to find that if, if I search for you, can somebody else comes up who I know. So it's, uh, it's kind of a connected world. Well, we, we definitely are. And, you know, the beauty about us and some of the other uh, friends that we have out there uh, is, you know, you hit the nail on the head. We're doing it for the education, for the cause effect of what we're doing. You know, I think mm -hmm. you can hear the passion in all of us. So uh, I'll, I'll put all your stats up as well on the show. Now, don't go away because after I stop recording, I just want to chat with you. But uh, I'll do my closing. So thank you guys again for, um, uh, for joining me on this show. And again, thank you, uh, all, all, all of my viewers. Uh, this, that's the end of the show, episode 100. I hope you enjoyed that. A lot of great conversation, a lot of smart information that you guys could take, especially those that are out, again, trying to propagate that education out into the marketplace. Uh, to talk to people about EVs. Continue to do that. I want to thank everybody who watches on YouTube, who subscribes, likes, dislikes. Uh, uh, it's up to you. I always enjoy the comments. If you have feedback, if you like this style of show and like the guests, please let me know because I will let these gentlemen know and then they'll probably hit me up for money or something. We'll have to wait and see there. But uh, let me know your comments, of course. Everybody who uh, supports me on Patreon, thank you very much. I'm always very humbled by that, as you know. And all the names are at the end credits. And, you know, my continued PSA, right? Stay safe. Follow your local health uh, guidelines for wherever you are, whatever they're asking you to do. I'm not going to stand on my soapbox and preach the value of one thing versus another. Use your common sense. If you feel it's safe to do, then do it. If not, then have a think about that, please. Uh, continue to follow the uh, EV marketplace because it is exciting. There's a lot going on. And again, I want to thank my guests for joining me way across the pond uh, on a different time zone. And for everybody that watches, thank you again. And I'll see you when I see you on the next show. Take care and bye-bye.